Back to Ecclesiastes, we turn into the fourth chapter again. We'll pick up in the ninth verse and continue through the twelfth this morning. If we step back just a little bit from the text of the chapter uh, thus far, in chapter four, we, I think, can see a theme developing uh, from the opening of the chapter, the difficulty of oppression, or at least an aggravating factor of it, was the aloneness of the oppressed. Remember how they had no one to comfort them. They were alone. And their aloneness left them vulnerable and defenseless and comfortless. From there, Kohelet, the preacher, turned our eyes to the greedily competitive loner in verse 4, who does his work not out of a sense of community engagement, not out of a sense of Uh, benefit for others or service to the Lord accomplished by the power of God's grace, but rather as a grasping, clawing, envious individual caught up in the rat race in the dog-eat-dog world. What vanity, he said, it's chasing after wind. How pathetic is the one person, notice the emphasis on one The one person who works himself or herself to death but is never satisfied with what has been accumulated. We could pull on our illustration again from last week of Ebenezer Scrooge. Alone in the world, riches and wild amounts accumulated and stored away and yet immeasurably and perpetually unsatisfied, unhappy and utterly alone in his misery. This also, Solomon says, is an unhappy business and vanity. Nor is uh, he any better who sits in the corner and smugly says, Well, I'll have no part of that rat race. I'm better than that. Or maybe like, I'm just going to ride it out myself, by myself. Another lonely picture in that case, isn't it? Of the fool off in the corner, eating his own hands, his own folded hands, a picture of a person burning through all he has, maybe everything he's got in the bank, and then all he is as a human being until even the last ounce of self-respect is gone. To quote those great theologians, the Beatles, all the Lonely people, where do they all come from? All the lonely people, where do they all belong? And the preacher has the answer to both of those questions, doesn't he? Where do the lonely belong? Well, they belong in community. That's where they belong. God did not create us to be utterly alone in the world. In fact, did he not himself say it's not good for man to be alone? No, He has designed us for togetherness. He has designed us for and with one another. And as with any of your household appliances or or tools or toys or, or cars or what have you, it's always best to observe the design, isn't it? Always best to follow the designer's plans and instructions. God has designed us for community. It's the person who isolates himself, who who cuts himself or herself off from all others around, who uh, breaks out against all judgment, as we read in the Proverbs, probably in all likelihood written by the same pen, carried along by the same Holy Spirit as the words before us today. No, no, isolation will not do. There is no way, no real way for human beings to flourish in isolation from one another. There is a much better way, says the preacher king, and we'll read it right after we pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the wisdom that uh, you supply to us in it. Make us truly wise, we pray. We ask it in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Ephesians chapter 4, beginning at verse 4. Two are better than one, because they have a good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow, but woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. Again, if two lie together, they keep warm, but how can one keep warm alone? And though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. Well, it didn't take very long for me to learn uh, that two are better than one, and, and three even better than two, when the flatbed semi-truck backed up to the overhead door of the hardware store just days after I had taken my first job there with a load of 80-pound bags of concrete that had to be removed from the truck and restacked by hand inside. And here I was, a scrawny 15-year-old kid who had ridden his bicycle to work that day and And I'm confident had rarely, if ever, lifted anything heavier than 34 or 40 pounds in my life. I remember vividly standing at the side of that trailer looking up skyward into the backlit, leather-like face, rugged of that truck driver, and patiently waiting for me to shoulder the sack of cement he had and was leaning conveniently over the side rail for me to carry and to stack on the empty skid inside the building, and a load of dozens of 80-pounders on the truck were to follow one bag at a time. Well, I jumped on my bike and made quick work of rounding up friends in the neighborhood who were willing to come and help me carry the burden. I was still sore that night after work, to be sure, but I was still able to stand for which I was glad because because I had a couple of friends. Two are better than one, says the preacher by divine inspiration, and sometimes three even better than that. I'm sure you all have your own stories and your own experiences uh, to confirm and demonstrate and prove this principle. Maybe you remember the buddy system from grade school when your teacher paired you with someone else uh, who, for whom you were responsible and who was responsible for you as your class spilled out of the bus into the museum and the field trip. Well, it turns out your fourth grade teacher was on to something, something really important. As a matter of fact, the buddy system is built right into the Bible, and it's a basic. It's a basic, and I mean that, of Christian discipleship. Each and every one of us needs others and needs one or two others, especially if we're going to thrive in the Christian life. I mean, look at the rest of Scripture through the lens of the text this morning, and now you'll see it in spades, you know, from cover to cover, this need for mutual help and aid, and protection, and support that comes from others. It fills the pages of the Bible. But right away we're faced with a difficulty here because, as you've likely noticed, our culture, our uniquely American culture that is, is not exactly prone to true friendships, the likes of which are described in shorthand here by Solomon. Americans don't typically even have close friendships. We are probably the most radically individualistic culture in the world and in the history of the world, and what we're experiencing right now is nothing new for us. All the way back in 1892, after visiting America, the Dutch theologian Herman Bavink made this observation, work, eat, sleep. This is the substance of American life. There is no time left 
for convivial friendship and conversation. That trend is only accelerated in our modern day. One report from uh, Duke University indicates that from 1985 to 2004, there was a nearly 30% drop in the number of close confidants that Americans enjoyed. In that same study, one in four of those surveyed in 2004 said they had no one at all in whom they could confide. That was 20 years ago. Think for a minute. 20 years ago, there was no iPhone. 20 years ago, Facebook had not exploded beyond student population anyway. It was before the pandemic of 2020 and its imposed isolation of global lockdown. From 1990, if you'll, if you'll take another study, from 1990 to 2021, another study says the percentage of Americans who report that they have no close friends has quadrupled. We're not Im- immune, are we, to our cultural zeitgeist? How many of us in this sanctuary can honestly say Look me in the eye now and say that you have a close friend. By which I mean the kind of friend described here in Ecclesiastes. One so close to you that you work together for a common cause. You lift one another up when the other has fallen. You support one another through thick and thin. Warming one another with your love and with whom you fight off the attacks of the one who would undo you alone. For the past few months, even yesterday morning, several of the men of our congregation have been studying this kind of friendship that Solomon describes here. Our session has been commending to our men the pursuit of of true Christian brotherhood toward the very ends described in our text today. This morning, I want to extend that invitation and make that exhortation to all of you, all of you men and all of you women, to find a friend or two, to develop a friendship with just one or two others, brothers in Christ for you men, sisters in the Lord for you women, with whom you can share this kind of love. Enjoy this depth of intimacy, this kind of relationship described in the Proverbs as a friend who sticks closer than a brother. There are four things that will mark the kind of friendship that I'm commending to you today. Look at them with me. The kind of friendship I'm, I'm talking about will, one, bring a better result from your efforts than you could get on your own. Two, will provide great assistance to you in facing personal hardships. Three, will offer relief to you amid adverse circumstances and conditions. And four, will afford you greater protection from the threats that come against you. First, dear ones, find a friend with whom your efforts may be multiplied getting greater results, better results, than you could get on your own. Verse 9. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their, tri- uh, their, their uh, toil. It is true in day-to-day life, isn't it? And you know it, that more can be accomplished by two together than by one alone. And that the efforts of two results in a greater uh, greater than the sum of its parts. That's because when we work together, we encourage each other, productivity increases, becomes greater, and, and goals are accomplished much more quickly and more readily. And, and this is true in church life, too. Have you noticed that any ministry that gets done around this place uh, that re- really enjoys true success and, and usefulness 
is a ministry that involves multiples. It's true in the business of the Christian life, too. You know, you don't you, don't you? You know how hard it is to put on holiness, to grow in holiness, as the Bible is calling us constantly to do, to put on new obedience when your efforts are purely solo. Here is where a friend to whom you can be accountable, I mean, genuinely accountable, will increase the effectiveness of your work. Let's say you're trying to be more faithful. Uh, choose whatever you want. Whatever new obedience you're trying to put on, whatever sin you're trying to put to death. Let's just take, for example, trying to read your Bible more faithfully. You know that you should be doing that more often, even daily, but, but alone you just can't seem to find the motivation. Uh, the temptation to leave it off and to fill the day with almost anything else, with all sorts of anything else, is overwhelming. And then you go to bed and you think, well, tomorrow I'll do better. But then uh, tomorrow and its promises come and go like a vapor. But if you have a friend with whom you can covenant to read, and perhaps the same passages on the same days, you know, the same chapter maybe each day, and, and then check in on one another and talk about the, the passage perhaps, just to keep one another accountable, how much more likely are you to accomplish your goal? Same with prayer. Or to read some spiritually minded book. To do it together you will more likely accomplish that goal. I say fill in the blank, whatever it is, and, and you know how much more uh, you will accomplish in this way, don't you? If you even periodically come together to read and pray together. Find and make a trusted friend my brothers and sisters, with whom your toil may be multiplied because it is shared. Second, dear flock, I commend to you in the Lord's name a friendship of two or three brothers or two or three sisters that will provide you great assistance when facing personal hardships. Verse 10, for if they fall, one will lift up his fellow but woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. And what Christian does not fall from time to time? We could just easily say here not if, but rather when. When you fall. We are all, all of us, struggling along in this life, wrestling with sin, sometimes stumbling, sometimes face-planting in sin. If this was true of the Apostle Paul, even near the end of his immensely godly life and ministry, and by the way, it was, Paul himself says it, then it most certainly will be true of you and of me all our lives long. The time to look for a friend, Christian, the time to develop such a friendship is not when you've fallen. That's not the time for you to start doing this, when you've fallen into the depths. No, the time for you to develop this kind of friendship in which you with time, will find the liberty marked by such a level of trust as can divulge your deepest struggles without a fear of your confidence being betrayed. I say the time to develop that kind of friendship is now, before you fall. So that when you do fall... When you do fall, 
you will be your friend, will be able to come alongside you and help you up. A Christian friend who can warm you, who can recharge you with the gospel, with fresh reminders of the forgiveness that is yours in Christ Jesus and cannot be taken away from you. To lovingly apply the balm of God's grace to your bleeding heart and hurting at the time you need it the most. I say the time to develop that kind of friendship is not when you fall, it is now. Third, in the Lord's name, I adjure you to develop a Christian friendship in which you will find true relief in the adverse conditions of life. Verse 9, again, if, you, if two lie together, they keep warm, but how can one keep warm alone? Now, it doesn't take a whole lot of imagination, does it, to understand the scenario that the author has in mind here. Yes, I know this uh, sometimes gets read at weddings these days, but the imagery here is not of marriage. The terms here are not familial. They are numerical. One. Two. It was common in that culture that people, especially if they were traveling together, would find themselves in a cold place at night. Cold weather would simply require huddling together to survive. Now, it's unlikely these days that any one of us is going to find him or herself in a place where falling asleep alone is dangerous to to one's life due to falling temperatures. But there are, there are those phone calls, aren't there, that cause your blood to run cold. There is news and there are circumstances that are visited on you and on me that threaten to pull the life right out of us, that break our hearts, that devastate our souls. You need a friend. You need a friend who will stick closer than a brother when you're down and troubled. It is little wonder in our friendless culture that the words of James Taylor leave us wistfully wondering but deeply doubting that the words could ever really be true. When you're down and troubled and you need a helping hand, you just call out my name and you know wherever I am, I'll come running. That winter, spring, summer, or fall, all you've got to do is call and I'll be there. That though people can be so cold that they will hurt you and they will desert you. They'll take your soul if you let them. You've got a friend. Dear ones, find a friend like that. And be a friend like that. To one or two other Christians. Adversities are coming. Of that much you may be certain. And there's no need for you. There is simply no need for you to face those adversities alone. None of you need to face the adversities that are coming alone. I mean, even the Apostle Paul, for crying out loud, called out to his friends to come to him, his trusted confidants, when he was in prison. He pled with them. You remember this. Hurry, please, hurry to me. Hurry to my son. I need you. You need this kind of friend. And you look around this room and you'll see a room full of people 
who to the man, to the woman, need that kind of friend. There's no shame in this. In fact, quite the opposite. God has made you and me this way. My friend Max Roglin, in his commentary on Ecclesiastes, writes that these verses reveal that the believing community is not designed for the, for, for the survival of the fittest, but for the survival of the weakest. The Lord has brought together the different members of the body. He's quoting Paul from 1 Corinthians. You remember when we studied that together. So that the one who has fallen can be lifted up. The one who is freezing may be kept warm. And the one who is about to be overpowered can be delivered and come out victorious. The reality is that every Christian will fall down at some point. And it is the grace of God that draws believers into community in which we can bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. I think you know he's quoting there from Galatians 6. Fourth and finally, pursue a friendship. Create a duo or a trio Christians that will afford you and afford them greater protection from threats that come against you and against them. Verse 12, though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. PCA pastor Gary Yeagle begins his book that we're studying in our, CP, our CPC band of brothers right now with the story of Scott. Scott, who was expecting the Iraqis to fire a few surface-to-air missiles at his F-16 when he got close to his target, but what he wasn't expecting was an all-out barrage beginning some 25 miles away. And through the terrifying explosion, Scott stayed on course, reached his target, and dropped his bombs. But as he pulled up, he could see an SA-3 explode right underneath his wingman's plane, blowing off his fuel tanks and putting what later proved to be over 100 holes in the fuselage of his wingman's aircraft. Miraculously, the pilot himself wasn't hit. Scott immediately flew to his wingman's side, conducted a visual inspection of the damaged plane, took over responsibility for his navigation and defense, and radioed for help. For the next two and a half hours, Scott worked feverishly conducting emergency diverts to refuel his wingman's plane and to keep him in the air long enough to land safely. Bad weather forced them to visit five different emergency landing sites before they were able to get to the ground. After, uh, uh, I mean, a half hour after Scott had landed, a brigadier general, who was one of the pilots on the mission, stopped by to visit Scott. And in the general's words, quote, Scott was standing, leaning against a bunch of sandbags, just holding on to them and shaking like a leaf. He couldn't walk. He couldn't talk. He couldn't move anything. All he could do was stand there and shake. The guy had nothing left he gave everything he had that day for his wingman. And that's what I'm calling every single one of you here to today, dear flock. Every one of you needs a wingman. And someone near you desperately needs a wingman, too. This life to which we're called in the Bible, it's, I don't remember it ever being described as a stroll, but it certainly is described as a war. And every one of you is in that war. You cannot fight this war alone. You're just not strong enough. 
And I think you know that. I think you realize that by now. And if you don't, mark my words, you soon will. Satan, your enemy, prowls around like a roaring lion to devour you. But with two of you, you will withstand him. A three-fold three, three cord is not easily broken. I'm calling you to establish these kinds of friendships, Christians, in which you can together, both of you or the three of you together, receive and supply the results, the assistance, the relief, the protection that can only be found in such relationships. Of course, this is, the, this is certainly the case when the third strand in the cord is Christ. Friendships with Christ in the center, they're nearly invincible. I will tell you how pleased I am to see such duos and trios developing in this congregation, and I challenge you now to take those friendships to an even deeper and higher level than they are right now. Two ingredients are going to be essential to make it so. Time and trust. The only way to develop the sort of friendships the Bible is telling us about here is to spend time together. The sort of time that it's going to require for you to develop trust. Slowly but surely, step by step, conversation by conversation. You could start small until you're confident enough that you can open your hearts wide and be perfectly transparent with one another, revealing to each other your hurts. Yes, even as the Bible tells us to do, confessing your sin to one another, but also rejoicing and celebrating the, uh, together the victories that some, such friendships are certain to foster. Men, find a brother or two. Women, you find a sister or two and begin to invest in those friendships. In the Lord's name, I tell you, you and your church will be very glad you did.